As the Industrial Revolution gathered momentum in the first half of the 1800s, a new problem exploded into view, literally. The problem was exploding steam engines, and it was caused by a chronic imbalance between power and materials. The early 1800s saw coal-fired steam engines becoming more and more powerful. Tens of kilowatts were now the average output, and hundreds of kilowatts, more power than a thousand humans working together could muster, were increasingly common in factories and mills. And at the same time as their power rose, steam engines were also getting smaller. The behemoths of the late 1700s had given way to compact models that were small enough to put inside a ship. Steamboats began carrying goods up rivers as well as down them. A few entrepreneurs were even starting to miniaturize engines further to fit them on new kinds of horseless carriages and steam tractors. But the combination of high power output and small size could only happen when the engines were run at a high steam pressure. And increasingly, in the middle of the 1800s, those pressures were becoming fatal. The earliest steam engines had operated at pressures only a bit higher than the pressure of the Earth's atmosphere, roughly one bar. A century later, their smaller, more powerful descendants were running at ten times that, and the pressure buildup was getting harder and harder to contain within the metal walls of a boiler. When one ruptured, it could blow buildings apart and blast everyone in them with a combination of saturated steam and flying engine shards, aka red-hot shrapnel. Notwithstanding the widespread uptake of safety valves, by the 1850s, boiler explosions were killing an average of one person every four days in American steamboats, mines, mills, and factories. In the next decade, the total reached one every day. Many more were badly injured. Boilers kept exploding because the steam they contained at higher pressure was now exerting more force than the materials they were made from could withstand. The early atmospheric pressure engines had had boilers built by riveting and soldering copper sheets together. For most of the 18th century, this had made sense, since copper was then the only metal that could be produced in large sheets, and then worked with enough precision to join the sheets tightly enough to contain the steam. But copper is a soft and weak metal. Though equal to the engines of the early to mid-1700s, by the end of the century, copper boilers were losing the contest against rising steam pressure. It looked as though the Industrial Revolution was going to be limited to lumbering, low-power, stationary engines, unless someone came up with a material equal to the demands of steam pressurized to ten times the atmosphere. Besides copper, the only other real candidate was iron. In Britain, the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution, this was available in two types, wrought and cast iron. Both of these, though, had serious problems. Wrought iron was a low-carbon, nearly 100% pure iron produced only in small pieces by laborious hand forging. In 1797, the largest wrought iron plate that Britain's most advanced iron works could produce was less than six feet by one and a half. To make a boiler, several such plates had to be stitched together with rivets that went in through holes punched by hand, often slightly out of place. Steam leaks were ubiquitous. James Watt's Steam Engine Company maintained a running list of recommendations for the owners of wrought iron boilers. In case of leaks, they were first to try hammering on the plates with a blunt instrument, then jamming the cracks with rope fibers or paper smeared with lead oxide. If that didn't work, operators were advised to pour a steady stream of raw oatmeal into the boiler while it was running, as the steam would make it flash cook, thicken, and gum up the cracks from inside. Oatmeal, while packed with nutrients and adequate for low-pressure boilers, was no match for an engine running at ten times atmospheric pressure. So the early experimenters with high-pressure and smaller engines began trying boilers made out of cast iron. By the early 1800s, blast furnaces could turn out this high-carbon form of iron in large quantities and in any shape that you could make a mold for. Since 1783, the puddling process had eliminated most of its problematic brittleness. 
Such cast iron was much stronger than wrought iron, and so a thinner and lighter plate could do the same job, and the use of standardized molds meant that all the rivet holes were in their correct places. But cast iron still had its problems. Any large casting almost inevitably contained, somewhere along its length, a microscopic and undetectable casting flaw that would eventually blow out the whole piece. In contrast, the forging process usually removed most of these from wrought iron. And unlike wrought iron, cast iron was reactive and tended to corrode, especially if the engine was being fed with a high sulfur coal. Moreover, cast iron tended to be inhomogeneous, with uneven amounts of carbon in different places, meaning that the strength and the brittleness of a cast iron plate could vary quite a bit over its length. So, users of low-pressure steam engines, mainly at mines and factories, preferred wrought iron boilers. Users of high-pressure steam engines in ships and railroads plumped for cast iron. But neither type was perfect, or even particularly good. Wrought iron boilers leaked too much to get to high pressure. Cast iron boilers did not leak, but had a disturbing tendency to blow up. The annual rate of boiler explosions and fatalities continued to rise. Nor was the problem limited to boilers. By the 1850s, the mismatch of materials to power was hurting all sectors of the new industrial economy. The cast iron rods, wheels, gears, and arms of manufacturing machines, if driven at the full rate that steam could run them, would break. Attempts to establish a railway system were going nowhere, as the traffic and train cars wore out wrought iron tracks so fast that maintenance and replacement costs bankrupted any would-be rail magnate who got into the business. And armies across the industrialized world were becoming more and more frustrated with the lack of advancement in the iron used in guns and armor, which, like boiler plates, were too often overmatched by the explosive energy they had to contain. The revolution in industry, and in everything the factories produced, was about to reach a plateau. Into this environment came Henry Bessemer. Born in 1813 to a British metalsmith specializing in printer's type, Bessemer was a man with a definite eye for metals. His first big break came when he figured out a cheap way to manufacture the metallic paints that Victorian interior designers delighted in plastering over every available surface. The invention broke what had been a German monopoly on such gilt paint, resulting at one point in Bessemer's outcompeted rivals having him arrested and deported from Nuremberg while vacationing there. But it also made him a wealthy man by his early 40s. He invested his profits in a foundry. At first, it and he were devoted entirely to brass, but the outbreak of the Crimean War in 1853 piqued his interest in the cast iron used in making cannon. This was an understandable preoccupation, as the performance of the British artillery at the front provided daily evidence of a need for improvement. At a dinner party the following year, he unexpectedly found himself explaining his ideas to a man who turned out to be Emperor Napoleon III of France, at that time allied with the British and Turks against the Russians. The problem, as Bessemer saw it, was that smoothbore cannon firing round shot were hopelessly inaccurate at long range. An elongated shell packed with explosives would be far more effective, but would have to be fired from a rifled barrel so that it rotated while flying. And rifling a cast iron barrel decreased its strength so much that it was more or less guaranteed to explode while being fired. The wrought iron used in small arms could be rifled, but wrought iron could not be made in pieces large and thick enough for artillery. There was one material that could do the trick, and that could also withstand the high steam pressures of boilers, the hard wear of locomotive wheels, and the constant driving of machine shafts. This was steel, which had a carbon content intermediate between wrought and cast iron, and a microstructure that conferred greater strength and toughness than any other material then known. But with existing technology, steel could be made only in small batches of a few tens of pounds at a time, 
by melting cast iron in crucibles or small furnaces at extremely high temperatures, while several workers stirred it with long iron bars for hours on end. This combusted the excess carbon and brought the overall carbon content down to the half a percent to two percent range of a good steel, but at a prohibitive cost in fuel and labor and a great deal of wastage. Bessemer set to experiment as only a man with a personal foundry and a blank check from the French crown could. He quickly identified the problem as one of getting air to carbon faster, and by 1855 he had invented the world's first steel converter. This was a large upright vessel lined with bricks of a composition specially designed to withstand high temperatures and hot corrosive liquids, with pipes running all along the bottom. The pipes blasted air into the bottom of the furnace as fast as pumps could push it, which had the double effect of circulating oxygen through the liquid cast iron inside the vessel and stirring it around. As Bessemer later recounted, at first, not much happened except for a few sparks. But after about ten minutes, the top of the converter suddenly began to emit a voluminous white flame, followed by a succession of mild explosions that showered the area with red-hot ejecta. Fearing that this miniature volcano would set the roof on fire, Bessemer and the workers attempted to turn off the air blast, but couldn't get close enough to do it. Fortunately for the roof and Bessemer, the flames died down in about ten minutes, and the liquid metal tapped out of the converter, cooled into a solid 600-pound ingot. The intrepid inventor promptly began hacking at the edges of this still-glowing ingot with an axe. If the metal had been cast iron, this would have sent red-hot shards flying everywhere, but the test in fact proved that what had come out of the converter was a pure uniform steel, malleable when hot, superior to anything else then available. And apart from the power required to drive the air pumps, not an ounce of fuel had been used. Twenty minutes of violent combustion of carbon with the oxygen blast had released enough chemical energy to heat the converter to the required 1600 degrees Celsius, all by itself. Although Bessemer had solved the main problem, it would take about twenty years and several adjustments to make steel widely available. His original design was unable to make a good steel out of iron with more than a tiny amount of phosphorus. Since about 80 to 90 percent of the world iron deposits then being mined were pretty high phosphorus, that was a rather serious impediment. It was overcome in 1870 when two cousins, Sidney Thomas and Percy Gilchrist, discovered that the lining of the Bessemer converter, if made from carbonate instead of silicate-based bricks, would absorb phosphorus from the liquid steel. They were, however, outdone by a still larger family group working in Germany around the same time. Three of the fourteen siblings of the Siemens clan took up careers as inventors and industrialists. Though the electric shaver was clearly not one of their developments, Werner, Wilhelm, and Friedrich Siemens, among them, invented the electrodynamic generator, a new type of telegraph, an international company that still bears their name, and, most importantly for our purposes, the heat exchanger. Incorporating two of these last to blast hot rather than Bessemer's cold air into a new regenerative furnace raised its internal temperature to 2,000 Celsius, enough to convert iron into steel 300 tons at a time. Some or even most of their design may actually have been developed by the Martin father and son steel making team working in France, but the point is the resulting furnace could make a good steel out of practically any type of iron, including cast iron with any amount of phosphorus and scrap iron. You could throw in alloying elements like manganese, nickel, chrome, and cobalt to improve the hardness and strength of the steel. For the first time, large-scale recycling, as well as primary production of iron and steel, was possible. 
By 1900, Bessemer and Thomas converters had seen their peak use, and the Siemens-Martin open hearth process was on its way to dominating 90% of the world's steel market. Since the 1870s, steel production had risen exponentially, and its price had fallen to a fraction of what it had been only a few decades earlier. For the first time in history, it was possible to cast large objects out of steel, multiple tons at a time, quickly, cheaply, and with whatever ratio of alloying elements was appropriate. The result was a material far stronger, tougher, and harder than anything that could be made before, and it opened up possibilities undreamt of. The I-beam was invented, and tall buildings became steel frames with glass and stone sides hung on them, the ancestors of today's skyscrapers. Superheated steam, at pressures never seen on Earth till then, began to drive steam engines. It became possible to build one small enough, but powerful enough, to pull a train. Railroads proliferated, bringing people and goods further and faster than ever before on tracks made from hardy steel. The small ironclad vessel gave way to the steel-armored, steam-powered battleship. New alloys strengthened steel gun barrels and shells, and hardened steel armor. Economist Stanley Jevons gushed, such are the qualities of steel that its uses would be infinite. Our engines, machines, vessels, railroads, conveyances, furniture would all be made of it, with an immense improvement in strength, durability, and lightness. Not since iron replaced wood in tools, he thought, had there been a material revolution that promised such progress. And that was what it was. The Industrial Revolution was a revolution of two things, power and materials. Coal-fired steam power had replaced the energy of thousands, unchaining production from number of workers massed to produce. But it took a revolution in materials to match it, to provide the steel that, alone, could safely harness that power for human use. <laughs>